Hi students, welcome to HSC Biology and Module 5, Heredity. This is video number 16 and the third in our series on polypeptide synthesis, this time looking more at the actual importance of the process itself. So in this video, we're going to be again talking about modeling the process of, pro of polypeptide synthesis and analyzing the function and importance of polypeptide synthesis. So that means we're actually going to focus on the process this time itself, why it's important and what it's actually contributed to our understanding of the cell and biochemical processes. Our usual three levels are uh, make sure you can understand the process of polypeptide or protein synthesis, uh, that you can outline some of the reasons why this is an important process and um, and ultimately I guess if you can evaluate the implications of this uh, particular process uh, for all life on earth and that would be a uh, kind of a good goal to aim for. So why is this an important process? Why have we spent uh, a little bit of time in learning about um, DNA and RNA, the different types of RNA and the relationship between the information that's present in the DNA molecule and the um, protein or component chains, the amino acid components that make up these protein chains um, that are built in a ribosome. So why is this important? Well, I think the first thing that we need to do is we need to um, just revise two very important terms in genetics, and they are genotype and phenotype. So genotype comes from gene. It's the information that is carried in the DNA. It's the sequence of bases. So what we have to do is go from bases to amino acids. So the phenotype is the physical expression. So it's how that genetic information actually appears uh, in the organism. So we now know that this is sequences of bases in the DNA, which code for sequences of amino acids in a polypeptide chain. We've used these terms probably more generally, particularly in, say, year 10, where you would have talked about things like A's and G's and T's and C's and, uh, and the alleles for tall or the alleles for short. And then the phenotype actually telling you whether you're going to have a, a tall or a short uh, individual. And um, those, is, those are Mendelian ratios and they're things we're going to be looking at um, in the next couple of videos after this series. Uh, so that's something for a little bit later on. So for now, what we want to do is just um, recognize that this shift from genotype to phenotype is the shift between um, nitrogenous bases, sequences of bases to sequence of, of amino acids. The interesting thing about this is that this um, reading of genetic information and the decoding of that information into sequences of, of amino acids is universal. We find that the coding for a particular sequence of amino acids uh, is coded for by a particular sequence of nucleotide bases in the DNA for organisms from bacteria through to humans. So for the very, very simple prokaryotic cells through to the very complex multicellular eukaryotic organisms, we find this genetic code is universal. The information that you're learning about this, about DNA, about polypeptide synthesis can be applied across the entire um, spectrum of life on Earth. There's also a translation element here, and we have talked about um, kind of more than one language. So we know that the polymers uh, of DNA, so the DNA is made up of lots and lots of individual monomer units. Now the monomers aren't traditional units in, in, in that sort of general understanding of polymers, such as something like uh, PVC, polyvinyl chloride, has a whole lot of vinyl chlorides or, or chloroethene. So they're the monomer units. So the same unit over and over and over and over again, you get multiples of these and you get PVC. This is slightly different in terms of a polymer because the monomer units aren't identical. There are four different types of nucleotides. And so therefore we have four different combinations and all the different ranges in which those combinations can occur to form DNA. But that also codes for um, 
polymers, proteins or polypeptides, which are made up of lots of amino acid monomers. And of course, the problem with the amino acid monomers is whilst we might have four different varieties of uh, nucleotides, we have 20 different amino acids. So there's an even bigger range of these that can be put together in all sorts of different ways in order to form different types of polypeptides and proteins. The important point is that we have to translate that information. We have to take the information that was in DNA that was coded in nitrogenous bases that were part of nucleotides, and we need to convert it or translate it into the particular sequence of amino acids that are part of a polypeptide chain. I guess going hand in hand with the universality of the genetic code is that we do find an increase in the number of proteins and the numbers of genes in more complex organisms. Uh, so whilst in humans we're probably looking at about 24,000 genes, which we would expect to code for about 24,000 proteins, in actual fact this is not the case. Um, because of the way that the DNA is structured and uh, read and interpreted, the 24,000, so roughly 1,000 genes per chromosome for humans, um, can then translate into probably up to over 100,000 uh, proteins, just in the way that the code is read. So there is definitely increases in complexity. There's lots of information that is uh, untranslated, regions of um, the DNA that are coding for, say, promoter regions or switches that turn genes on or off for them to be expressed or not expressed, and even regions within that um, gene uh, section, which are not actually read as part of the sequence as well. So there's a lot of complexity that occurs in these systems. They are universal, but we do find complexity building. Obviously, the number of proteins you might need to form all of the requirements for a single prokaryotic cell, you can expect to be much less than what you would need to form all of the requirements for multicellular organisms with specific um, systems, organ systems, uh, different types of cells carrying out different types of functions requiring different structural proteins, different types of enzymes. All of this increases the complexity of the process, increases the number of proteins that need to be produced, and therefore is going to increase the genetic code that's required to uh, encode for all of those different proteins. A kind of side spin-off um, effect, which has been very important to our understanding, probably not as important to life on Earth in one sense, although to our manipulation of it certainly, is the fact that our understanding of polypeptide synthesis has led to things like gene mapping. For us to be able to know exactly which genes are on which chromosomes in which different types of organisms. This led to the development of the Human Genome Project. And the Human Genome Project had both a public and a private arm. And the information that was made available as a result of this has greatly expanded our understanding of where different genes are and some of the uh, small changes that can occur that have quite significant implications on the proteins that are produced uh, or not produced as a result of um, our understanding of where these genes are. So here's just a quick overview of the um, history of our understanding uh, of genetics, I guess. Um, I've, I've kind of highlighted the Human Genome Project on this timeline. Most timelines obviously go back a lot further. Um, we do have Mendel in here, and we're going to talk a lot about Mendel in future videos. Um, but this one looking specifically at some of this information around the Human Genome Project. And I guess the important thing to focus on here is the time frames. Uh, in terms of scientific knowledge, this is actually a very short period of time for such a rapid increase in an our level of understanding um, of the human genome. And this is not atypical for our study of genetics. In fact, one of, the, one of the dangers of making videos is you know they date, they will be old. The information that I'm giving you is, is not going to be up to date, it is right now, but probably even then it isn't because there's things happening all around the world uh, in lots of research places, universities, uh, private companies, 
that are working all the time at refining these techniques, understanding the genome of not just humans, but a range of different types of organisms um, better, understanding how those genes work, how to turn them on and off. Uh, all of this stuff is continuing to develop at quite a rapid pace. And so it's really important that you um, retain your curiosity about these sorts of things and continue to look at um, the massive increases in information that we get, uh, especially as computers have become better, faster, capable of storing so much more information. This is an area where the genetic code is a massive amount of information. So we need computers to be able to um, cope with all of the data that's being produced. And as these computers get better, so we're able to do these things more efficiently and more quickly, and our knowledge continues to grow. Two experiments you might want to talk a little bit about um, in relation to how our understanding has grown around um, polypeptide synthesis is firstly the experiments of Biddle and Tatum. Uh, who work with bread moulds. Um, and I've given you just a, a brief overview of these two experiments, and you can probably look at them in a little bit more detail. The first one, the Beetle and Tatum one, is really to cut to the chase where we came up with this idea of each gene actually coding for a specific protein. One gene, one protein. Um, this is later modified to one gene, one polypeptide. We know that proteins can um, have... Uh, tertiary structures, they fold up on themselves. Sometimes they have other things added to them um, and that can slightly change the way they function as well. So more correctly, I guess, um, is one gene, one polypeptide. But the one gene, one protein idea did come from the work of Beetle and Tatum where they were using x-rays to create mutants. And we'll look more at mutagens and mutations in the next topic, in the next module. Uh, but some interesting experiments here that helped them conclude that a change that occurred in the genetic information was actually causing a change in the sequence of amino acids and hence in the integrity of the proteins that were produced. Nirenberg and his colleagues uh, looked more specifically at exactly what that code was in terms of the amino acids that were being expressed. So, so the classic one for him is what's called the poly-U. So they were able to produce synthetic messenger RNA, and we know now that um, you can create lots of this synthetic um, nucleic material. You can put it into bacterial cells and get them to um, treat it as if it was real um, genetic material. But what these guys did is they put basically a sequence which was all used in. They used 20 different test tubes with 20 amino acids in them and in each test tube one of those amino acids was radioactively tagged, a hot one if you like, and looked at where the proteins were being produced. So um, as we now understand if you just have U's all the codons will be the same, they'll all be U, U, U which means they'll, the anticodon will be AAA. And what they found was that the polymers that were produced, the, the polypeptide sequence, was all phenylalanine. And so therefore they linked UUU to phenylalanine. And this is one of the things that's really important um, in terms of increasing our understanding of exactly what it was in the messenger RNA code that was coding for that transfer RNA to bring in that specific uh, amino acid to create the protein chains. So these are two really important experiments worth looking at in a little bit of detail to help um, stretch your understanding of exactly what it is that we know about this very important process of uh, polypeptide synthesis. Now probably the most important thing um, about polypeptide synthesis is the fact that it produces proteins and proteins are going to get their own separate video and that's coming up very soon. Thanks for watching.